This is your daily Facts Matter update, and I'm your host, Roman, from the Epic Times. And as a super quick aside, I'd like to mention that Facts Matter is now available as a podcast. So if you listen to podcasts on Apple, Google, or Spotify, you can find our episodes on there as well. And frankly, it's going pretty well. For instance, over on Apple, we're already the number 64 podcast in the news commentary category in the U.S., which is not bad considering that we've only been uploading there for about a month, but uh, those are still rookie numbers. So check out the podcast, leave them a review, and let's see if we can break the top 10 by the end of this month. And now, let's begin today's discussion over in the state of Michigan. Just four days ago, a woman who was both a county elections official as well as a former township clerk, she was charged with illegally tampering with ballots during the 2020 primary election. Here's what the Michigan Attorney General said as a part of her announcement regarding this crime. Quote, Election officials must uphold the integrity of their positions. Those who abuse that commitment undermine the very foundation of our democracy. Our department is committed to prosecuting election violations, regardless of the political party of the perpetrator. Now, let me back up for a moment and explain exactly what happened. To start with, this is Ms. Kathy Funk. She's a Democrat, and back in the year 2020, she was both the Flint, Michigan Township clerk as well as an elections official. And in August of 2020, she was up for re-election as the clerk of Flint Township. Now, right there, on the surface, you might already see a conflict of interest. Because this woman, she was both on the ballot for re-election, but she was also an election official herself. She was in charge of conducting her own election. Regardless, though, no one seemed to mind, and that's how things were set up. And so, then the election took place in August, and according to the unofficial count, Ms. Kathy Funk won her re-election bid. However, the margin of victory was extremely slim. The unofficial tally showed that the votes were 2,698 to 2,619, meaning that Ms. Kathy Funk won her seat by only 79 votes. And so, with such a slim margin, her opponent, Ms. Manya Triplett, she was considering asking for a recount. However, this is where things you can say got a little weird. Because before the recount could actually take place, Ms. Kathy Funk, who again was herself an elections official, she filed a police report with the local Flint Township Police Department claiming that there was a break-in in the elections office and that an official seal on one of the canisters that contained the ballots had been broken. She claimed that someone had broken into the election office and then broke an official seal on one of the batches of ballots. Now, why was this so important? Well, it made the recount impossible. That's because under section 168.871 of Michigan state law, this is the relevant law that governs recounts, this is what it says, quote, the board of canvassers conducting a recount shall recount all ballots of a precinct using an electronic voting system unless one or more of the following circumstances exist. And then right underneath that, the very first circumstance under which a recount cannot take place, it says this, quote, the seal on the transfer case or other ballot container is broken or bears a different number than that recorded on the poll book. The breaking or discrepancy is not explained to the satisfaction of the board of canvassers and the security of the ballots has not been otherwise preserved. And wouldn't you know it, that is exactly what happened. Since the seal on those ballots were broken, the challenger had to give up her intention of conducting a recount and Miss Kathy Funk, well, she was certified as the official winner. However, what's interesting to note is that Kathy Funk did not even remain as the township clerk for too long. Instead, shortly after the election, shortly after she won the election, she actually resigned her position as the Flint township clerk to instead become the Genesee County election supervisor, the top elections official within Genesee County. However, it looks like her tenure is being cut short because, as I mentioned earlier, according to the Michigan Attorney General, there was no random break-in at the elections office in the year 2020. Instead, after conducting an investigation, the Michigan Attorney General found that it was Ms. Kathy Funk herself who broke the seals on the ballots so that the recount would be impossible. Here's specifically what the official statement from the Attorney General's office said on this matter. The former Flynn Township clerk faces felony charges related to the August 2020 primary. The Department of Attorney General alleges Kathy Funk purposely broke a seal on a ballot container so that the votes inside, under Michigan election law, could not be counted in an anticipated recount. Funk was running for re-election and narrowly prevailed in the unofficial count. Meaning that Ms. Kathy Funk now faces two charges, which for your reference are ballot tampering as well as misconduct in office, both of which are felonies, each punishable by up to five years in prison. Now, Ms. Kathy herself, she maintains her innocence, and here's in fact what her lawyer released as a part of a public statement. Quote, she says it's absolutely not true. And so we'll just have to wait and see what happens once her case goes to court. At this very moment, Ms. Kathy Funk is out on a $25,000 bond, and she has a court date scheduled for March 30th within Genesee County. And so by the end of this month, we will have more updates on her particular case. However, since we're on the topic of election integrity, let's move on over to the state of Wisconsin. 
On a previous episode, we've already discussed how, just last month, the Wisconsin State Supreme Court, they issued a ban on drop boxes for the upcoming April elections within the state of Wisconsin. However, it looks like the city of Milwaukee is keeping them in place anyway. How? Well, according to Milwaukee election officials who spoke to a local media outlet, they said that they have found a way to let voters continue to drive up and drop off their ballots by temporarily turning early voting sites into extensions of the election's office. Here's specifically what Ms. Claire woodall Vogue, who is the executive director of the Milwaukee Election Commission, here's what she told local media. We will have additional staff with staffed drop boxes for curbside pickup, meaning that by just relabeling them, the city of Milwaukee will be able to have drive up ballot drop boxes at nine different sites across the city. Now, the local news outlet, they asked this executive director what allows her to take this course of action, to which she replied by saying this. So the judge in Wakasha did say that he believes that we can extend the clerk's office, or in my case, the elections commission office, to our in-person absentee voting sites. The judge was very specific that in-person absentee sites are allowable sites for staffed drop boxes, and that's exactly what we're doing. We want to play it safe. We would never put anyone's ballot at risk. And so what she's essentially saying is that they will have someone standing next to these drop boxes on the streets. And by doing so, these drop boxes are now at least technically an extension of the elections commission office, and therefore they are allowable under the current law. That is rather amazing. The only difference with these new drop boxes is that they will not be open 24 seven, and instead they will only be receiving ballots during the set hours when someone from her office will be present on site. And just for your reference, here are the nine places in Milwaukee where these drop boxes will be located. If you'd like the actual addresses of those nine different locations, as well as more details about either what's happening in Milwaukee or what's happening in Michigan with that ballot tampering case, I'll throw all those links into the description box below this video for you to check out. And all I ask in return is that you vote with your finger, not by absentee or by mail, but you instead you vote with your finger in person by taking a moment to smash, smash, smash that like button so that the YouTube algorithm will be forced to share this video out to ever more people. Now, let's switch gears just a little bit and discuss John Durham's investigation. All right, I want to take a quick moment to introduce the sponsor of today's episode, which is the best emergency food supplier in America. I'm, of course, talking about my Patriot Supply. So we are here in a kitchen studio. Let me show you this. There is no food. Now, you know what's happening in this world right now. You have the Ukrainian war. You've got the China's zero COVID policy. You have our supply chains stretched to the max. You have the oil price skyrocketing and so many other problems which are likely going to coalesce into our supermarket store shelves. And so the time to prepare is now. And the best place to do so is over at MyPatriotSupply.com. Over there, you can find emergency food kits that will provide you with breakfasts, lunches, dinners, drinks, as well as snacks, totaling 2,000 calories per day so you can maintain your strength and your energy for when you need it the most. This is frankly one of those products where if you buy them now, you will not regret it in the future, and the only thing you will think is why didn't I even buy more? So head on over to MyPatriotSupply.com and place your order today. My Patriot Supply is America's largest preparedness company. They have quite literally millions of satisfied customers who are now prepped and ready for anything that's coming. And these and their emergency food kits are in stock and they're ready to ship today. And they ship in unmarked boxes directly to your doorstep so your neighbors don't even have to know that you are prepping. Again, head on over to MyPatriotSupply.com. Place your order today so that you can be prepared tomorrow. And now let's head on back to the studio. Now, while I was down in Florida about a week ago, I took the unique opportunity to sit down and speak with Mr. Doug Collins. He's a former congressman who used to sit on the House Judiciary Committee, and we discussed a broad range of topics, including, from his insider's perspective, what's really happening with the Durham investigation. Take a listen. So you were a ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee. Yes. So the Durham, uh, <laughs> so yeah, of course I have to bring oh, it up yeah, in that case. Yeah, so, the, so the recent Durham filing uh, has some new revelations about about something actually not not related to the FISA spy warrants, but related to something else regarding the Alpha Bank kind of uh, narrative that was spun, spun there. Uh, can you give us your insider statement? Yeah, basically everything Durham has done in any of the public filings he's had is basically said for us, it, it was it said what everything we'd been saying was true, that there was a concerted effort by the Clinton campaign, by the DNC and by others to actually spy on Donald Trump and to make a connection between Donald Trump and Russia. This all started, for historical purposes, you've got to understand, this all started with the Clinton email scandal, which started out of Benghazi. This is not a one or two day cycle. This is about a 10 year cycle now. So after the email server was discovered, the email it began to be investigated, the House and Judiciary and House Oversight was investigating, and then all of a sudden you had Comey give the uh, clearance that no prosecutor would have prosecuted Clinton, which is a lie, they, they should have, and then a few weeks later you begin to see the process of the collusion story that we see that actually Obama and Biden were informed of in the White House saying that this is what they're going to try and do. 
Then you start seeing Strzok, McKay, uh, uh, Page, and that narrative that lasted through 2016 through the election that they were trying to tear. If you remember the text message that says we have an insurance policy. All of this is, is tied together. So it may seem disconnected, but it's not. Now it went on into the White House. We knew that from Comey, who Comey said we, we exploited the first few days of the administration to try and gain information. This was the Michael Flynn issue and everything else. And now we're finding out that it was that the background spying was actually even more. So I think what Durham did was peel back what we knew was there, but it very disturbingly tied it to the, in my opinion, to the Department of Justice and to our intel community. That's the story that I don't understand why people are not writing about. Why are they we not focused on, well, how much did they know? And if they were able to do this without uh, intel community knowing, that's even more of a disturbing part. One thing that happened when that filing came out is that the lawyers representing the, the tech executive yeah. and, and the, uh, you know, Michael Sussman, they came back and they said, well, actually, you know, we were contracted to, to do this work. We happened to, find, we happened to find this information and we did the right thing. We, we were patriots who did the right thing. From your, uh, you know, view from being right. in the House Judiciary Committee, is that normal for that to happen? Like, no, no. okay, so no, tell it's me, not. Tell me. I, I think that what we're finding is is a, a concerted effort by a political campaign coordinating with a sitting government that uh, was against a, a candidate, and I think this is that's not normal. Okay, and if it is normal, then we got a, a big problem in this country. The government should not be a tool for political campaigns. It should not even be a wink and nod if this. So when you look at what is happening here, I think Durham put it out there for a couple of reasons. One, I think he was putting more pressure on Sussman, although he had a, a uh, perjury charge on him. This was saying, look, you, you cooperate more with us or we're, you know, we've got all this. You're, 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 you're going to get you. But it's also, I think, sending out another message, not only to Sussman, but to others saying, wow, I didn't think he was going, you know, this is where they're at in that process. Because you've not seen, I mean, they've been out there a little bit, but some of the big players have not really wanted to comment. I hadn't heard Comey, you know, he's not been any, you know, posted any pictures of him in the woods lately. You know, there, there's a lot of things out there. So I think there's a lot of discussion going on. What does he have and how is it going to affect us in the long run? Now, if you'd like to check out that interview in its entirety, you can do so over on Epic TV, which is our awesome no censorship video platform. And by the way, besides on there, besides our show, you can find a plethora of other great content, including a new phenomenal episode of Over the Target, where Lee Smith dissects exactly how the U.S. ruling class is fueling, funding, and arming the war on America. I'll throw a link to Epic TV. It'll be down in the description box below. And then until next time, I'm your host, Roman from the Epic Times. Stay informed and stay free.